Welcome to Let's Hear It. Let's Hear It is a podcast for and about the field of foundation and nonprofit communications, produced by its two co hosts, Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. No relation. Well said, Eric, and I'm Kirk. And I'm Eric. The podcast is sponsored by the Communications Network and the Lumina Foundation. We're talking to people about their work and what's happening in the field with the hopes of making this growing arena just a little bit more accessible to us all. You can find Let's Hear It on any podcast subscription platform. You can find us on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast, and you can email us at hello at Let's Hear It Let us know if you have any thoughts about what you hear today, including people we should have on the show. And if you like the show, please, please, please rate us on Apple Podcasts so that more people can find us. So let's get on to the show. And we are back. It's another edition of Let's Hear It. We're so glad that you found us. So glad to have you here. And once again, I find myself looking across at my colleague, my co-host, and the guy who does all the work, Mr. Brown. How you doing? It's good to see you today. Kirk Brown, my bosom chum. Okay, I need to tell people something, <laughs> which, which was we were talking right before we rolled and I started exchanging pleasantries and you had no interest. <laughs> you said, save it for the show. <laughs> we're, we're, we're running live. We're going to keep this really fresh. And I got to say, we've got some ground to cover because um, we've had a lot of really good guests on Let's Hear It. And and I'd commend to you an email I sent you a few years ago. I don't where you almost Where you almost sent me a restraining order when I suggested it to be a really good well, idea. I did send you a restraining order. Apparently, it was not <laughs> delivered appropriately. Yeah, that's right. I changed my address. But today, this is a new peak, Mr. Brown, because we've got Emily Ladau on the podcast and we will get into it after um, the interview and the setup, but I want to start right up front to by saying that um, we have been challenged by Emily to think about how we are presenting this work. And I want to say that there have been frankly, just some omissions. There have been some things that we could have been doing all along that we weren't. And Emily has through total graciousness. This is such a gracious, honest, intelligent conversation, but through total graciousness has helped us um, see a different way to approach the work. And so anyway, I want to say thank you for that, Eric, and say thank you for doing this work because once again, let's hear it is challenging us in a very deep way. And oh my gosh, what a privilege to hear this conversation. Yes. So Emily Ladau is a, a disability rights activist and she is a writer. She's a storyteller. She's a digital communications consultant. Hire her because she will help yes. you and your organization do better. And she didn't put me up to that. <laughs> I just know what's right when I when I see it and hear it. Uh, she's also the author of a book called Dis- Demystifying Disability, What to Know, What to Say, and How to Be an Ally. That's published by 10 Speed Press. And I just thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with Emily and learned a lot and became better, I hope, <laughs> as, a, as a person and, and realized that you can work in a business for a really long time and still uh, there's so much more to know and to learn. And I deeply appreciated Emily's, uh, her, her generosity. So you can find Emily at emilyladau.com. That's L-A-D-A-U. Emily also has her own podcast at theaccessiblestall.com. Please check out that podcast. And then you'll find Emily at on Twitter at Emily underscore Ladau, L-A-D-A-U. And I'll have some things to say about her Twitter feed when we come back. But this is Emily Ladau, and let's hear it. Welcome to Let's Hear It. My guest today is Emily Ladau. Emily is a disability rights activist, a writer, a storyteller, and a digital communications consultant. She's the author of Demystifying Disability, What to Know, What to Say, and How to Be an Ally, which was released in September 2021 by 10 Speed Press. And she is also the host of the Accessible Stall podcast. And I could go on, but I won't. Thank you, Emily, so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be with you. Emily, I don't know where to begin with your really interesting story, <laughs> but let's let's begin at the beginning. How did you get into this work? Sure. So if we're going to really start at the beginning, I was born with a physical disability called Larkin syndrome. It's a genetic joint and muscle disorder. And my mother has it as well. And 
her younger brother, my uncle, also has it. And so you could say that the career that I have is quite literally inextricably a part of my DNA. But more than that, it is part of my identity and very much a part of my story. So because my disability is something that I was born with, it very much shapes how I perceive the world and how the world perceives me. And as I grew up, it became something that I was increasingly passionate about talking about and educating people about. And so I guess the start of the journey, if you will, even though it was technically the day I was born, was actually getting to appear on several episodes of Sesame Street when I was 10 years old and getting to educate kids and their caregivers about my life with a physical disability. And it kind of just grew from there. What did you learn about yourself when you were on Sesame Street? And you could speak to children and obviously television producers and other folks about about your life. What did you hear back? I wish that I could say that I understood the immense privilege that I had at age 10 to be on Sesame Street, but I think that I learned more of it in hindsight. But what I can say is that I got the chance to sit down with one of the script writers who wrote the introductory episode uh, where I would be appearing on the show. And knowing even at that young age and even with less consciousness that I wish that I had had about the importance of the experience, I still knew that there was something very special about being told that my story mattered and that I was the central figure in my story and that I had control and input over how that story was told. And not only that, but that story was going to be told on a national platform. I so often looked for representation of myself when I was younger. And there was a young girl who was a wheelchair user who appeared on Sesame Street before I did. And she was one of the very, very few people like myself who I saw in the mainstream media. And then suddenly getting to be that person for other children and for other adults was this significant symbol that my identity and who I am as a person really did matter. Can you talk a little bit about your disability? How is how is your life different from people around you? I think that's a great question. And it's hard to say that it's different in any one way, especially because the disability experience is so unique to each individual. So there's more than 1 billion disabled people in the world. And that means that you're going to have more than 1 billion opinions and experiences and ways of navigating the world. And so my experience, yes, is different than a lot of the non-disabled people around me, but it's also different than the disabled people around me. It's just different than everyone. But for me, you know, my biggest different experience, I guess you would say, than most of the people in my life, uh, with the exception, interestingly, of my mother and my uncle, you know, is that I'm a wheelchair user. Although as I've gotten older, I've grown a group of friends who also have different types of disabilities. And so I'm just used to being surrounded by all different types of ways of getting around the world, of seeing the world, of navigating the world. And so to me, to identify any differences would necessitate saying that my disability is unique to everybody else's and therefore this is my very different experience than everybody else's and it's it's a it's a tough space to navigate because on the one hand there's lots of wheelchair users on the other hand my experience as a wheelchair user is unique to me so it's it's hard to identify specific differences honestly the point that i'm reminded of was was when we first started talking about asking you if you would be willing to come on the show you said that you would ag- agree to be on the podcast but that we would a- as long as we would make a transcription available to people who 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 had hearing challenges and it was a reminder to me that 
this is something that I probably should have been doing all along, and I now will endeavor to go back and transcribe all of our episodes, but that your work is not about people who use motorized wheelchairs or something that is very specific to your experience, but that your work is designed to help everybody understand the very different abilities of people and to make the world more hospitable to them, to to bring people in. Can you talk a little bit more about that expansive understanding about h- how we can do this and how we can start thinking about it? A hundred percent. And I'm glad you brought that up. I make it a priority to participate in things in a way that makes them accessible to everyone. And interestingly enough, what people don't always know about me is that I do have a hearing loss, although I am a hearing person. And so I benefit from captioning and from transcripts as well. So do a lot of people, whether or not they identify as a person with a hearing disability. So sometimes we need to think of accessibility as something that just makes things easier and better for everybody. And also, I'm a big believer that when you know better, you do better. And so there's a lot of people whose podcasts I've been on where I've said, hey, have you thought of transcribing it? And, you know, not only is this good for people with disabilities, it's also really great for your search engine optimization. So, you know, there's multiple reasons why it's a good thing to do. And people say, I hadn't thought of that before. And I don't take that as any kind of personal affront. What I realize is that we are not socialized to think about disability. It's not something that we talk about. It's really relegated to a a taboo that we don't bring up in conversation. And so, of course, transcription is not something that's the first thing on people's minds, because if you don't talk about disability and accessibility regularly, you're not thinking about it. And so my goal with the work that I do is to bring people into conversations about disability, to offer a way to bridge that gap that so often exists between non-disabled people and people with disabilities. And further, to get people to understand that disability is not this niche issue that we think it is. In the United States alone, one in four adults has some kind of disability. And that's any kind of disability. It's not just people who use wheelchairs. There's so many different types of disabilities. And what I want to do is not be a voice for them because that's not my goal. I am one person. I cannot speak for everybody. I do not presume to speak for everybody or to know everyone's experiences. And I come at this with a significant measure of privilege as a white woman, as someone who communicates verbally, as somebody who has access to technology to do this educational work. So I don't speak on behalf of everyone, but I do ask that people think not just of me when they think about disability, but recognize that it's an entire population, an entire community that we need to do better in including. Your point reminds me of one of my favorite examples about the value of reducing, making a more equitable society. The story about curb cuts comes in when the Americans with Disabilities Act went in. It required that cities and other places be made more accessible to people who use wheelchairs. And then what they found out, of course, is that once there was a curb, a curb cut, then a parent with a, a child in a stroller or the person delivering from UPS also had greater accessibility to streets and sidewalks and buildings and all these other things. So your idea that by transcribing your episode, you improve your search engine optimization is the ultimate example of how, you know, understanding for other people's disabilities has these multiple benefits. And I think it's also true that we don't know. It's it's almost impossible to know how much benefit you get from making things more accessible, but that you can only everybody like this is one of those things where everybody wins and you just open my mind some more on that uh so it's it's um thank you (laughs) thank you for helping me (laughs) i'm so glad and it's true accessibility really does benefit everybody 
you know, when something is inaccessible, you're shutting so many people out. And it may not even be people who specifically identify as having disabilities. You may just be creating an unfriendly or unwelcoming environment for a lot of people. And so what you're talking about, about the curb cut effect, is one of my favorite examples, because not everybody can get up and down a curb. But suddenly, when you have a curb cut, you've just opened up so many more opportunities for people to get from street to sidewalk. It doesn't matter if you're a kid on a skateboard or a person pushing a laundry cart, whatever the case may be, suddenly you've just opened up the world in a new way for so many people. And so I ask people to think about where they can create curb cuts. Where can you create curb cuts so that everybody can be a part? of what's going on. We're going to be back with Emily just after the break. I want to talk about this amazing career that you have created and or that you're experiencing or uh, because you've uh, you've written a book, you're consulting to a, a lot of organizations, you're helping others experience this same thing that just happened that just hit me in the head by with like with a two by four about 10 seconds ago so uh, i and i really want to talk about how you got into that and how and and more about your work so we'll be right back after this break with emily ladow you're listening to let's hear it a podcast about foundation and nonprofit communications hosted by kirk brown and eric brown let's hear it is sponsored by the communications network which connects gathers and informs the field of leaders working in communications for good because foundations and nonprofits that communicate well are stronger, smarter, and vastly more effective. You can find Let's Hear It online at letshearitcast.com or on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast. Thanks for listening, and now back to the show. And we are back with Emily Liddell, a disability rights activist, a writer, a podcaster. Uh, I'm I'm very excited about listening to your podcast because I love the name The Accessible Stall. Which, which is which is brilliant. It's a fun and, one. And your work as a consultant. Talk well. First of all, uh, I'm I'm really excited about your book, Demystifying Disability: What to Know, What to Say, and How to Be an Ally. Uh, because the the book has that same, I I I'd say welcoming tone that you have. It's design. It's 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 voice. Talk, can you talk a little bit about writing that book and and how how it has been re, re, how people are hearing about it and and what they're how they're responding? I mean, honestly, that's the highest compliment to say that it is welcoming because that was my ultimate goal. What I have always tried to do is make the disability experience accessible to people because I and this may be a little bit of an unpopular opinion think that advocacy is very much a two-way street and so if we want the world to become more accessible and inclusive then let's make the disability experience more accessible to non-disabled people and I recognize that that is in many ways a burden on a marginalized community to do the educating and I don't expect that of anyone. I recognize that it's a lot of work. That being said, we have to start somewhere. And I am a big believer in meeting people where they're at. And in the case of disability, a lot of people simply aren't exposed to disability in any kind of conversation, not in their school curricula, not in the media, not in the people that they are surrounded with. And so for many, it's a a new concept, even though one in four people have disabilities. You may just not be aware of that or conscious of that. You may not even know that you yourself have a disability. And so I wrote Demystifying Disability as a way to provide a starting point for some of the basic tenets that I hope people will understand that might make them feel a little bit less uncertain about how to have a conversation about disability and about how to be a good ally to the disability community. So I talk about language and I talk about history and etiquette and media representation, you know, it's trying to be a broad overview, but what it's not is 
the definitive guide to everything you need to know about disability or the Bible on disability or the encyclopedia of disability. I'm one person. There's simply no way that I can encompass every experience of disability. But what I can do is offer that starting point and that safe space for people to begin to learn about things that may otherwise be scary and unfamiliar to them. I'm going to ask a I'm going to ask a challenging question. We're dealing in our culture right now with with we're having a lot of difficult conversations. We're having difficult conversations around race, around gender, around sexual orientation, and we're not having a lot of difficult conversations around disability, if you ask me. I think most organizations worth their salt right now are are digging in on on race and equity, and they're digging in on gender, and we people will share what their pronouns are these days. Or, but it doesn't sound like we're at that same place with disability. And the question is, well, one, I mean, how do you feel about that? But what, what, are we, what can we do about it? It's to, in the sound of our voice, there are a lot of foundations and nonprofits and large institutions who, who my guess is probably could or should be addressing this topic. How do they take that on? How do we create more space? How do we make the world more accessible to everyone? I'm really glad you asked that. And I often say that disability is relegated to the margins of marginalization. We don't even talk about disability. And when we are not talking about disability, we are not adequately doing any other social justice work either, because disability is an identity that cuts across any and all other identities. And it's also a community that anyone can join at any time. And I don't say that as a threat, I say that as a reality. And so when we are talking about racial justice work, when we are talking about gender inclusivity, if we are not talking about disability, we're not really being inclusive because the full spectrum of gender identity exists within the disability community. And disability cuts across every racial identity and ethnicity. And so if we're ignoring disability, if we're leaving it out of the conversation, then you're not recognizing the whole communities that you're saying you want to serve. So we can't leave disability out of the equation. It's not something that is separate, but we tend to either ignore it or silo it or treat it as its own niche issue that isn't really relevant to the rest of our conversations on identities and social justice. But the exact opposite is true because disability exists in every community, in every space. And I always remind people, every issue is a disability issue because disabled people exist in this world and are impacted by everything that we do at the policy level, at the employment level, education, healthcare, you name it. It's a disability issue. Well, let's that's good good segue to talk about your work and how you work with organizations and others. How how do you help folks tackle this or address it? What does your work consist of? How do you consult with people? I do quite a variety of work. I'm very lucky that I get to wear multiple hats. I would say that one of the key ways that I educate is through storytelling. So a lot of my consulting comes down to getting to the very human aspect of disability. We can so often look at disability if we look at it at all as numbers and data and statistics. And we need those numbers. We need those hard facts. We also need to humanize disability. And we need to recognize that it is a very individual experience in addition to being a broader community. And so my consulting work rests largely in first breaking down some of the key concepts that I think hold people back from talking about disability. So uncertainty about language and uncertainty about etiquette and just talking about the disability experience sharing my story and amplifying the stories of other people 
I'm really getting people to recognize that disability is not this scary alien thing. It's very much a part of the fabric of human diversity and a part of the human experience, a very natural part of the human experience. And so my consulting work really is focused on storytelling, humanizing, and bringing people into the conversation in a way that feels, I want to say challenging, but also comfortable. What do you tell an organization about how to get started? How does, in the sound of her voice, again, if, if I'm at a foundation, how do I start thinking about this? What should I do first? And what do I do other than hire you, uh, which is probably a good <laughs> idea. But how, how does an organization get started on this journey to become more accessible? You know, I really want people to understand that meaningful inclusion is not going to be a linear journey. I think that everybody is looking for the magic formula where you do this and it brings you to this next step, which brings you to this next step. And in so many ways, there are steps that you can follow. But I also really want people to recognize that sometimes there's going to be multiple streams going at once. And you're not always going to get it right. And one of the key things that I do in my, my day-to-day work life is I'm the digital content and community manager for the Disability and Philanthropy Forum, which is a forum that provides resources and information for people who are seeking to learn more about how to make their philanthropy-serving organization or foundation more disability-inclusive. And what we provide is a wealth of information about how to get started. But a lot of times it means auditing yourself internally, taking a look internally at your organization and saying, what are some of the first steps that we can take, but what are some of the bigger initiatives that we can begin to focus on that aren't going to happen overnight? So for example, a good first action item is to think about your language, to think about whether or not you actually mention disability on your website, to think about how you're talking about disability, if you're talking about disability. That's a small but also very important step you can take. But then there's broader steps like connecting with members of the disability community not doing work on behalf of a community without consulting and centering that community. And you can't build those relationships overnight. But what you can do is begin the process of reaching out to organizations that are local to you or national organizations or organizations that are already doing work relevant to your foundation's issue areas. And again, that's not gonna be a linear process, but it is a key first thing that you can begin the work of doing. Is there an organization that is an exemplar that you saw their eyes open up and really make some some changes and, and how that benefited them? No, I think there's so many. And to be honest, rather than naming one specifically, I think what I'm most excited about right now is that through the Disability and Philanthropy Forum, we have the Disability Inclusion Pledge, and it's for foundations and philanthropy-serving organizations to sign on to and commit to what we've laid out as eight action agendas. And again, they're not linear. They're all focused on both internal and external operations, whether it's making a more accessible workplace or whether it's focusing on more inclusive grant making. And I think that so many of the signatories of that pledge are exemplars for this work. They're really showing what it means to say, we have work to do to become more disability inclusive. And we wanna be part of a community that's committed to doing that work. So I'm actually excited to say that I don't feel the need to pinpoint one organization 
because there's multiple organizations that are starting to do this work. I have to tell you, you're the best guest I've ever interviewed. You're so, <laughs> you're so oh good at God, this. I asked, you, <laughs> I asked you an awkward question and you pivoted off of it perfectly and, and made a much better point than I ever could have elicited. <laughs> That was absolutely masterful. For folks who are listening, go back and listen to that section again. That's how you answer a question. <laughs> like, I, I'm going to ask a, a better question than this fool just asked me. But no. <laughs> thank you so much for that. And thank you for your work. I've, I've learned so much in the last half hour. And and you've expanded my mind and my made my life a little better. I, I hope that we can do that for others. I hope that... that uh, we can pay that forward and that your work continues to to grow to blossom because it's it's really inspiring and i i i encourage foundations out there to go ahead and take the pledge understanding that it's a journey and it's not linear but get started and certainly read emily's book and listen to your podcast um Emily Liddell, thank you so very, very much for your time. Thank you for having me. And honestly, thank you for making disability a part of this conversation. Well, it's uh, the pleasure is entirely mine, and so is the privilege. Thank you again. And we are back. Emily Liddell, what, what an introduction. What an introduction to this topic. I mean, Eric, wow, what a conversation. It was a great conversation. And yeah. again, I... Uh, so appreciate people who know a lot more than I do, but don't make me feel like an idiot and don't make me feel bad about not knowing. And I just appreciate that. I have, we, we all have much to learn about a variety of things and disability given the, it's yeah. given how many people, what is it? A billion people with disabilities in the world that, that it's, it's, it is a, a large number of a, a significant portion of our population who are deeply underappreciated and, we, as a collective, need to do much more to understand and to find ways to, to engage and make life better for folks who we are not taking properly into account. And that's so important. And we, I mean, just given the the breadth of it, something that I, <laughs> I don't know, I I was born a, a Catholic kid in a Jewish neighborhood who believes in karma. So between the guilt and the karma, I'm I'm really behind the eight ball. And this, I just felt awful for my. I just feel like I can be doing a lot more, and we can be doing yeah. a lot more. One of yeah. which, of course, is transcribing our episodes. La last month, we we uh, did an episode with with Aaron Belkin, in which we transcribed on the website. Uh, and now I got to go back and do the other 64 mm -hmm. episodes mm -hmm. before that. Well, in that whole thread about providing transcription, and again, it's what a generous, awesome, absolutely appropriate, helpful comment, and so many others along the way in terms of just this whole consideration around disability. And the, the note that I made around that part of the conversation, Eric, you know, Emily says, if you don't talk about disability, you're not going to think about it, you know, and, and we've talked on this podcast about this notion of people being unseen right in our midst and being unseen. And so what does Emily point out? One billion people with disabilities. Oh, and, and about these disabilities, they cut across all identities. They're an element of all other communities. And I love that part where you actually started talking about difficult conversations and how we're dipping into conversations around race, equity, gender, our use of pronouns, trying to be as inclusive as we possibly can. And uh, and Emily points out, yeah, and guess what? There are people with disabilities across all of those other um, other communities. And and let's let's have this conversation too. Oh my gosh, Emily, <laughs> forever in your forever in your debt. Yeah, yeah, you're right. One of the things that so get just getting back to this transcribing your episode and putting it on on your website she points out very astutely that it's well uh, it's also good for you because it'll improve your search engine optimization mm -hmm. and it really gets back to equity which is that if you conduct your life mm -hmm. in an equitable way it benefits everybody well what's Emily doing to help she's writing about it she's bringing this to the forefront she's got her book demystifying disability yeah. what to know what to say 
and thank you how to be an ally, right? Right. You know, how, how can we be supportive? And, um, what I really appreciated too, as she's going through her story, talking about her experiences, by the way, get started on Sesame Street. Right. Mic drop right there. Old, Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here, here's a person of consequence. But she's very clear, you know, she she's very clear in saying that her, her book is not the Bible of disability. She's very clear in being in stating, I am one person. My experience with disability is mine, and there are one billion other experiences. But she can offer her perspective, which is, you know, a key part of what she's trying to do is to provide the storytelling, this ability to humanize disability. And I loved that thread. She says, I'm going to, I want to work on storytelling. I want to humanize and I want to bring people into the conversation. And oh my gosh, this balancing act, bring people into the conversation in a way that is challenging, but comfortable. And, and, and I thought, what what a perfect roadmap for all of the communications work that we want to do that is aspirationally about making the world a better place. Let's tell the stories that pull forward the human narrative and challenge people in this conversation, but but don't lose them, right? Don't 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 lose our audience members. And, and, and of course, what do we hear Emily say along the way? I'm going to meet people where they're at. And, 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 and she gives us a, once again, we get a master's class in what that looks like in the conversation because she's just nothing but gently gracious and expert and accommodating <laughs> through the entire conversation. Yeah. And by contrast, basically uh, what I do is I bring people into the conversation in a way that is boring, <laughs> but deeply uncomfortable. Right. And this is, I have so much to learn. Yeah. <laughs> So, so once again, it's clockwork. You, we've we've talked about the twenty minute mark of these interviews. It's minute twenty three, and, and it's such a good exchange. You ask, how can you get started? How do you get started? And I actually loved how Emily talked about that because she kind of described it's not a magic process. It's not linear. <laughs> You're gonna have multiple strings going at once. And you're not always going to get it right. I was like, Emily, how do you know me so well? <laughs> you know, but she says, <laughs> you are not linear, not Kirk. I, I will That's tell you <laughs> for the folks out and, there, not linear, Kirk. And get and, 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 and not getting a lot right, as it turns out all the time. But, you know, what does she say? She says, audit yourself internally, look for the simple steps, and then also embrace the bigger initiatives. And just that way of thinking about it. There's so much space. There's so much space to step into this. And so I've already been, you know, through with our, our group over here by Slack saying, hey, let's let's start running this audit. Let's start thinking about this more intentionally. And again, Emily, I'm so grateful for you being on this podcast and bringing this perspective because the way you frame it is so immediately actionable. And that's genius, right? I mean, I mean, just to take this very difficult and challenging thing and then make it so accessible. Oh, man, it's just it's awesome. I agree. And for anybody listening to this who works in an organization, there is something that you can do to make your work more accessible. You're right. You you have to start asking that question. What can I be doing? What am I, how am I presenting our, how are we, I presenting our work? Mm -hmm. How are we connecting with people who uh, deserve to be connected with, but aren't being, we're not, we're not providing them what they need in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Those are simple questions that you can ask. And I mean, get Emily's book, which is it's light hearted. It is in itself one of the more accessible texts you can read mm -hmm. about an issue that can be very challenging and uncomfortable for people for any number of reasons. And this is, you know, it's just great stuff. We, boy, oh boy, oh boy, can we learn so much from Emily just by seeing how she does this work, which is as, as good as it gets. I loved this piece at the end when you and Emily were talking about this, where Emily says, you know, a good first step is just look at your language. Like, do you actually mention the word disability on your website? Do you talk about it? And again, if you're not going to talk about it, then how does it become anything but unseen, right? Remain unseen. And then I love the other piece of it, which is this doesn't go fast, but you have to, you also have to need to make connections in community. And that takes time to build those relationships. Like this is so actionable, but so tangible it's really, I, I love that direction. Yeah, it's, like I said, it's great to be able, <laughs> been around a while, 
And oh boy, I have a lot to learn <laughs> even still. <laughs> and uh, of course, we need to both raise our hands and say we commit to doing better. And there's a lot more yeah. to do. It's not just tr transcribing our, our episodes, but to, yeah. to really learn about how to engage and connect with people who have not been, who we're not meeting, we're meeting them where they are. And, and that's important. You know, before we leave, we should talk about the Disability and Philanthropy Forum. I was going to say, I just, I love that commitment to working at scale. So this is at disabilityphilanthropy.org. The Disability Inclusion Pledge, you know, it's got eight action agendas. So entities sign the pledge, eight things that you're going to commit to, to advance this conversation. And I counted, there are 68 signatories to that pledge so far. And when you look at the roll call of, of the entities that have, are participating, it's a who's who, and there are some major resources, which is so exciting. And then also, when you look closely, you notice, oh, actually, there's some other big time entities that um, if they're not there yet, you hope they'll be there soon. And this is the kind of mobilizing, organizing, but again, invitation to action that's just so powerful. And um, so I love that that work is happening, too. And it's it's great to see entities and philanthropy engaging with that. Yeah. If you, again, if you work for a foundation and nominally some of the folks out there, I think are working for foundations, check out disabilityphilanthropy.org and figure it figure out how your foundation or philanthropic entity, whatever it is, can engage. Sign the the kind of like the minimal square one thing is <laughs> sign the pledge, but then you have to actually mm -hmm commit to doing the things that you signed and, and get get engaged and get involved because there are so many folks out there who both benefit from your work and also deserve to be a part of that conversation and to be engaged in the way that makes the most sense. Again, I have to say, I come back to Emily, the work you've done to be ready to guide us so graciously with so much generosity, working through all the things we need to, to become such experts, but also compassionate experts. Um, man, what, a, what a treat. And Eric, I just, I, I love that moment when you're like, okay, that's it. This is one of the best answers I've ever heard on this podcast. It was good. It, it was pure gold. Outstanding. Go back, listen to it again, take it apart for what it is and understanding the question, a pivot to the thing you really want to discuss, a way to make your incredibly stupid interviewer not seem like such a schmuck and, and still get your point across. It was, it was, that was really good. Well, anything else to say before we go, Eric? I mean, this is Emily Liddell. What a treat. EmilyLiddell.com. Please find her podcast at theaccessiblestall.com, on Twitter at Emily underscore Liddell. And of course, you know, you can see the work at disabilityphilanthropy.org. My goodness. Tour de force. It, what a treat. It was great. We should all present an accessible stall. <laughs> That's Those are my parting words, Kirk. And until next time, let's hear it. Thanks, everybody. Okay, everybody, that's it for this episode. Please let us know if you have any thoughts about what you heard today or people we should have on this show, and that definitely includes yourself. And we'd like to thank John Beltrano, our enthusiastic production assistant. John Ali, the tuneful and inspiring composer of our theme music. Our sponsors, the Communications Network and the Lumina Foundation. And please check out Lumina's terrific podcast, Today's Students, Tomorrow's Talent, and you can find that at luminafoundation.org. We certainly thank today's guest, and of course, all of you. And most importantly, thank you, Mr. Brown. No, 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 no. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Brown. Okay, everybody. Until next time. Let's hear it. <laughs> Ready when you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is okay. You're just so frustrated. <laughs> You're so prepared. <laughs> You're just like, I'm working with an amateur. I can't believe how far. I can't work like this. How far I've fallen. I was on broadcast television. That's right. I was on a network. And now I'm with a dork in my dining room who can't stop laughing. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay. Okay.